So, Heather, uh, earlier this week, you wrote a piece entitled uh, Donald Trump's Coming Police State. We have a president who wants unlimited power and won't respect the rule of law. I mean, this is we've seen some of this, right? I mean, do you remember when John Cornyn on the floor of the Senate, there was threats to federal judges and John Cornyn mm -hmm. got up there and sort of danced around it. And he said, look, I can. I'm not advocating threats to federal judges, but I can understand why people would be upset with them. Um, this is this sort of eliminationist uh, rhetoric we've heard from the right in this country. But Donald Trump seems to be taking it to a uh, heretofore never visited place. Absolutely. And, you know, this has been one of the things that I've been most uh, as I was writing daily about Trump during the campaign and following, I, I watched a lot of his rallies and a lot of his speeches, most of them, in fact. It was clear to me that, you know, Trump doesn't have a whole lot of bedrock beliefs or even understanding in, of, of the way government works or what it's supposed to do. But he is at heart an authoritarian, and he believes in a strong, strong police apparatus and the use of policing to control the population. That is just it goes all the way back to the 1980s, he was saying this, and he, he has never deviated from that belief. And so, you know, his his actions in the first couple of weeks to me are, are they are not surprising, but I think they are uh, illustrative of, of exactly who this guy is and what we have to fear from him on, in, in this way. Um, you know, the the uh, the ban on, on travel from people from certain Muslim countries, I think, you know, obviously that was a, an explicit promise that he made during the campaign. And he fulfilled that with his executive order, and it has been traveling through the courts uh, since the moment that he <laughs> that he signed the order, and it just all the chaos ensued. Um, but one of his, but his big rationale behind it, and his anger at the courts for refusing to just rubber stamp what he did, is all about his idea that if the president believes that the country's in danger, he has a right to do whatever it takes to keep us safe. That's just his belief. And, you know, he, that's a very simple-minded view on him. It's a dictatorial view. But it's not unprecedented, as you point out. People like, you know, John Cornyn also kind of, hey, you know, I, let's just say I, I understand why somebody might want to take out a federal judge, okay? Ha, ha, ha. But, you know, people like John Yoo during the, during the uh, Bush administration, he's, you know, he's a guy known for writing the torture memos, which, you know, uh, it's sort uh, of... Uh, legalized torture under the euphemism enhanced interrogation. But he also right. this was... This guy worked you know, in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice. Office of Legal of Counsel, yeah, at the Department of Justice. And he legalized it, which kind of gave a get-out-of-jail-free card to all the people who actually did perpetrate the torture because they said, well, we were operating under a legal understanding. But it wasn't just that. He was pro you know, a proponent of a view called the Unitary Executive, which stated that in a time of war... The president pretty much had unlimited powers to do whatever he chose, and that included the, uh, in his view, the the uh, suspension of posse com the Posse Comitatus Act, which precludes the military from uh, getting involved in any kind of domestic disturbances. Um, and he was very, very strong in this. So was Dick Cheney. Loved John Yu, and basically, you know, was a big proponent of the unitary executive. So there is a legal. Uh, background to all of this. Donald Trump knows nothing about that. He's never heard of John Yu. I am sure he has no, I've never heard the words unitary executive. This is an instinct with him, but it fits perfectly yeah. into that. And that's one reason why people were, you know, screaming bloody murder. Hey, you know, you set this up as a precedent. One of these days we're going to get some, you know, some or <laughs> You know, strange reality show TV, reality TV star in there who thinks he's, uh, you know, Emperor Alexander, and uh, they're going to use these powers. Well, we're about to see how that works because there are these precedents. I'm sure that Donald Trump's lawyers are going to use them uh, in arguing uh, as as these cases come come up into the courts. And we're going to see where that ends. So that you know, you have to. Let's let's just not lay it all at Donald Trump's doorstep. I mean, right. there there was groundwork laid for this. Uh, and has been for quite some time Both among by, legal figures <clears throat> on the right. But, and, and, and frankly, you know, some of it is also um, President Obama, and not so much in the in the context Absolutely. of this uh, uh, immigration ban. Um, we should say that, you know, the, the notion that the immigration ban in any way came from uh, uh, Barack Obama's administration is, is, is patently false. Um, people have widely 
misinterpreted um, a those why those seven countries and what the designation was under the Obama administration, and b the fact that it actually came from uh, a Republican Congress. But but beyond that, uh, certainly in terms of surveillance uh, issues, in terms of of, of targeted uh, assassinations and. Much of the security state, much of it, uh, and, and people can read Charlie Savage about this, much of it, um, the, the, the primary difference is that it became more rationalized and legal, legalistic uh, and brought into an existing legal framework uh, under uh, Obama. So that's very much of a problem. But let me read a tweet that, um, that Donald Trump um, uh, wrote earlier this week, and I don't, uh, I am... Definitely not one of those people who is obsessing about his tweets, but I think this really does uh, exemplify what you're talking about. He uh, tweeted on uh, Wednesday morning, uh, if the U.S. does not win this case, he's talking about the, um, the case that came into the Ninth District. It was argued in front of three people, um, and uh, the plaintiffs were from Washington State and uh, Minnesota, the states themselves, actually. If the U.S. does not win this case, as it is so, as it so obviously should, we can never have the security and safety to which we are entitled. Now, that uh, in and of itself is, is sort of ridiculous. But then he had a period, and then he wrote politics with an exclamation point. And people should be clear here. He's not complaining about politics. He's complaining about our constitutional form of government. He's, you know, he is saying, like, the fact that we even have to go through this process is wrong. The fact that any of my uh, proclamations, as he uh, announced to the, um, uh, to the to those sheriffs and police officers gathering in D.C., his proclamations were not immediately um, and consistently upheld is, uh, is an offense to him. 